passive haptic learning for computer sonography, which predictably involves two components. There is passive haptic learning and computer sonography. Uh, I'll start by giving an overview of passive haptic learning. Um, so the idea behind PHL is to teach motor skills without attention. Right? Um, and we use wearable technology for this. We administer haptic tactile stimuli. Um, on the left here, we have some gloves that are able to administer stimuli. And on the right, it turns out <coughs> Google Glass is actually, if you play a sound at a low enough frequency, it kind of acts like a, a vibration uh, motor there. Um, so the kind of the first modern PHL study was Mobile Music Touch. And it teaches a sequence of piano notes uh, using a glove. So it'll vibrate, um, kind of, It'll vibrate your fingers in sequence alongside kind of a piano tune that you're hearing in your ear. And it turns out that after we stop applying stimuli, people can actually play the song that they were able to, or that they were, that they were feeling uh, while, they were, while they were wearing the glove. Um, it turns out we can also teach corded systems like braille typing. Uh, a corded system just means that you're pressing, for the input method, you're pressing more than one key at once, right? So this graphic kind of shows the mapping of, of kind of how the keyboard would map to an actual braille matrix. Um, and so to do this, we administer these uh, stimuli in sequence. We go one after another instead of doing them all at once, right? So if you need to do like the ring finger and the pointer finger on one hand and the middle finger on another, we would vibrate them in sequence um, so that you kind of don't get overwhelmed by the stimuli. Um, and it turns out, in fact, that this type of passive haptic learning can, the, the information that you gain from this learning <coughs> can be used to do more than just, you know, play back pressing the keys that were vibrated, um, people can actually read and write Braille um, after learning in this method, uh, with this method, which is kind of cool. Um, then we also have a, a keypad study, which demonstrates the idea of having more than one responsibility for a particular finger. Right, so here, you need to be able to press the top, the middle, or the bottom key, uh, and we do this with two motors, right? That top motor means you're pressing the top key. The bottom motor, if you feel that, you press the bottom, and both at once means the middle. Um, and so that's kind of cool that you can teach you know, more and more complex things. So I'll take a step back and talk a bit about computer stenography before we talk about how to merge the two together. So we have to start with stenography or shorthand. These are synonymous. Uh, shorthand, back in the old days before computers, it's just a writing system, uh, typically a phonetic one, right? And so I have no idea how to read this. This is Greg shorthand. Um, but this is, right, you can write really quickly, typically at the rate of dictation, very useful for police officers, journalists, secretaries, who need to be able to write things down quickly um, and can't really fit in you know, actually writing out every spelling of every word. Um, and so yeah, it's used for dictation. The stenotype is machine stenography, computer stenography. We have a machine kind of similar to a typewriter or a keyboard. Um, and then computers, if you plug these things into computers, they can perform an automated translation. So you type in, again, these are typically phonetic uh, systems for stenography, but you'll press down some buttons on the keyboard that correspond to phonemes, and with a big dictionary, the computer is able to figure out what words you meant to write. And this is particularly useful. We'll get to some of the uses later. First, I want to talk a little bit about just how this works. So this is kind of a, a conceptual overview of what this kind of keyboard looks like. Um, you construct syllables, so entire syllables, all at once from phonemes. It is a corded system. Um, and so if you wanted to type the word straps, for example, you would type the S-T-R-A-P-S -S going left to right, all at the same time, and then release those keys all at once, and you type the word straps. Um, now, of course, not every phoneme is present on this keyboard. It doesn't even have as many keys as the number of letters in the alphabet. Um, so some phonemes require multiple keys. Uh, this word laugh, right, the A-F kind of makes sense, the AF sound, but how do we get L from H-R? The answer is just that that's how this stenography system was designed back when it was made. Uh, since in English, the L sound doesn't really conflict with the H or the R sound, uh, we found that you know, just making it HR seems to work. Um, and indeed, in this example, uh, we have one finger that's responsible for pressing two buttons at once. Right? So this is a complicated <coughs> input method. Now, why are we teaching this? Why do we want to do passive haptic learning for computer stenography? Stenography is useful. We use for live captioning. right? You see this on, on live broadcasts all the time. You can use it in theory for any text entry. You can use it to send messages to your friends or to write a novel. It could potentially be useful, since it's used at the rate of dictation, to actually be a replacement for speech for people who are unable to speak. Um, and as a job, stenography live captioning can be done even if you can't see very well. You do it remotely from home, and it's actually a pretty good job opportunity for these people. The problem is that learning is hard. Stenography schools tend to be non or for-profit, uh, the Brown College of Court Reporting, it's right up Spring Street, Spring Street, 
costs $12,000 a year to attend. And the dropout rate nationally for these schools is 85%, which is bonkers. Um, it's just, it's so hard to acquire these skills. The software and hardware cost thousands of dollars, but the ideas are free. So there's this software, um, Plubber. It's an open source software that can turn most keyboards into a stenotype machine. Um, and they're also the same organization is working on building good open hardware. But we still need to solve the problem of learning stenography, right? And that is where passive haptic learning for computer stenography comes from. Stimuli are hard. It's like the Braille study, where we have corded keys, uh, corded input methods, but we also have, like the keypad study, each individual finger has to do more than one thing. So we administer stimuli in sequence like before, and we use gloves that look like this. And Cord, you're not to ask me how I took this photo because I don't remember, but um, it, it, it tends to work pretty well. We see a few problems um, that we didn't see in the keypad or braille study. One is that just because of how complicated this is, the stimuli tend to be overwhelming even when we do them sequentially. So one solution is to chunk the stimuli a little bit, you know, have like the stir and then the ah and then the pus instead of straps all at once. We can also do this with the audio that they're hearing, right? So we can either say straps and then chunk the stimuli, or we can say stir, have them play stir, ah, ah, and pus, right? So this tends to help for sure. Um, and in the first two studies we did on this, we didn't do this, and it didn't work very well. And finally, we're starting to see some results, which I'll talk about. Um, we also, that multiple responsibility for finger thing didn't really work back in the keypad study. We weren't getting interesting information because in that study, it was like only top keys, and then in a separate test, only middle keys, and then only bottom keys. So stenography in a single input has, you know, kind of going back and forth. So we needed to solve that. And one way we did this is with different stimuli. So the top of your finger, not only does it use the top motor, it also has one long vibration. Instead of uh, on, the, on the bottom finger, we have two short vibrations, the bottom of the finger. And then if it indicates both, it's kind of a jittery vibration on both motors. So that was one solution. Um, and then this is just uh, typically uh, just a tricky input method to use. Um, so we added a training session. That training session was able to kind of give people the opportunity to use stenography effectively um, before and kind of understand the stimuli before we tried to teach passively. Um, and we also indicate at every point which section of the machine to use. This is an example test where we say, you know, that to use that PS, you're just using the right part of the keyboard. And we found this definitely helped. And it works. Um, we test with and without audio chunking. Every participant is showing some amount of improvement. Um, and most of the participants are seeing it in both the chunked and the unchunked versions. And that typically is uncorrelated with the, the performance on the distraction pass, right? We have them do something else to make sure this is actually passive learning, and it doesn't seem to matter. So these are uh, the people I work with, Nearby Night, working on that Flutter project. And of course, thanks to all of you for coming today. Uh, if anyone has questions. Thank you. Okay, so we have two minutes for questions if anyone has any. Not all at once. <laughs> yeah. uh, I noticed on uh, one of the slides where I think it was the keypad mm -hmm. that the numbers were renumbered. That is yes. quite a, uh, what was the purpose? So the point of that study, and let me see if I can go back, um, <clears throat> was just that we're trying to teach them, we teach individual positions of keys, right? We're teaching this new input method, which is really just, here's how you write you know, the number nine, which is not in the normal position. So we taught all of those in sequence, and then the test was press the two key which isn't where it would be on the normal keypad, right? The same thing happens with Braille. Um, they were able to teach every letter of the alphabet. Um, they've done it on Morse code as well, right? They teach, and then they test in a different order, right? And so we're kind of showing that this passive learning can do more than just replay the information that you learned, but also kind of mix and match information. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Is this, is this specific to kind of fingers and stuff? I mean, like, or, or could you teach someone how to like, drive a car. Right, so we're exploring different kind of ways to do this with motor skills. Um, mostly it's been fingers. Uh, I did mention that we use Google Glass at one point. Um, so really any part of the body can be stimulated that it tries to know how to drive a car. But the Morse code study I mentioned actually did it with Google Glass. For the input, it would tap, and also for the actual stimulus. Hmm. So it, it, sorry. Uh, uh, on your last slide, you said you got you saw improvements. Um, what were your baselines? Yeah, so so we do this. We have a pretest for a particular word. We say this is you know try to write this word, and of course they don't know how to do it because they've never done stenography before. Then we teach, and we see um, 
probably right now. And so traditional like keyboard uh, input methods for error tracking don't really work because a chord is different, right? A chord is you press down a bunch of keys at once. The order doesn't matter, but getting a chord right does. So we count the error is just the number of keys that they were supposed to press that they didn't, plus the number of keys that they did press that they shouldn't have. And then we divide to normalize it. We divide out by the number of keys they press. Okay, so it's not an improvement over previous techniques to teach the Right, same no, this thing. is improvement just okay. actually over their performance. Like there was learning. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much.